This is the black experience for all. Glenn E. Martin is the founder of Jim Real Estate, a multi-state real estate investment company, and Jim Trainers, a successful nonprofit consultancy. For two decades, Mr. Martin successfully conceptualized, created, and directed a handful of national multi-million dollar organizations in the nonprofit sector. He is also the founder and visionary behind hashtag Close Rikers campaign in New York City. Well, Glenn, uh, I just wanted to say thank you very much. Uh, th thank you for taking time out of your very busy day to My spend time with us at the Black Experience. As you know, we're about telling the stories of successful black Americans like you to help inspire young people and to help eliminate racism. So it's an absolute privilege and an honor to get a chance to talk to you and add you to our ever growing, you know, phenomenal collection of episodes. So thank you very much. Well, thanks for that. I'm honored to be here. So what I'd like to do, Glenn, and, you know, we can go any ways you like, uh, because I always you know, at the end of the interview, before we post it, you know, you take a look at it, make sure you're happy with everything. But what I'd like to do is I always start with family, foundation, you know, parents, grandparents, and, and sort of the role that they played uh, in, in you growing up. So if you could just talk about, you know, where you were born and just some of those elements, that would be fantastic. Yeah, I appreciate that opportunity. So I was born in Brooklyn, New York, and I uh, spent the first eight, eight years of my life in the Caribbean on a small island called Grenada. That's where my mother was originally from. Um, that's where she met my dad. Uh, so my dad was a police officer there, ultimately became chief of police. Uh, my mother left, came to uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn, um, at a time when, you know, it was pretty difficult in New York for anyone, much less a single parent with two sons, my older brother, Sheldon, and I. Um, and uh, she ultimately uh, had a third child, Adam, my younger brother. And uh, so we came back to Brooklyn at about the age of eight. My older brother was nine. And uh, we were- and what, what, what year is this approximately, Glenn? Yeah, we're talking about the late 70s, uh, mm -hmm. just before 1980. And so we stayed in Bed-Stuy straight through the 80s up until the early 90s, which is the beginning of the crack epidemic and so on. Um, but I remember my mother trying her hardest um, to raise three boys. And I remember her bouncing from low income job to low income job, you know, trying to make it work and leaving us home alone because she really didn't have much of a choice. And, uh, you know, you leave three boys alone in Brooklyn back then, they're just going to find ways to get in all sorts of trouble. I will say this, my older brother Sheldon um, was smart enough to, uh, one, he was, just, he was into sports much more than I was. So that kept him busy and safe. Um, and then he signed up for the military at a relatively young age and left when he was 17. And that really changed the trajectory of his life. Um, and it allowed for definitely a different path through life than my younger brother, Adam, and myself. Well, two, two questions. Why? Why Brooklyn? Why Bed-Stuy? Why, why did your mother choose there, Glenn? Yeah, that's a really good question um, because we definitely stood out. Um, I stood out for a couple of reasons. Um, one, because she was Caribbean and there were a lot of Black Americans there at the time. And two, uh, because I am the product of a uh, mixed, you know, mixed, a mixed race uh, relationship. So my dad is white, my mom is Black. And at the time, I remember everyone kept speaking Spanish to me because they were like, you must be Puerto Rican. Uh, <laughs> it was almost as though uh, fair skinned black didn't exist back then. Yeah. So I remember some of the challenges of that also, but also the challenges of having a white father who sometimes showed up, rarely, but sometimes showed up. Um, and being in Bed-Stuy with this white man where the only other time people saw white men was police officers, teachers, and firefighters. Interesting. And, and I'm curious, Glenn, in terms of being the only or one of the only uh, people of color from the C Caribbean, how, how what was that sort of like in terms of interaction with with uh, American blacks? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, uh, I remember trying to lose every bit of my culture as soon as possible. 
Mm. I remember doing everything I could to try to integrate. And, you know, I had a Caribbean accent. I lost that a long time ago. I ended up with a Brooklyn accent that I can't shake now. Um, I remember uh, trying to be like my Black American friends. Um, I remember how much people were invested in material things, uh, hip hop, um, uh, music, you know. So I, I just really try to immerse myself in the culture so that we didn't stand out okay. because I found it to be at the time pretty embarrassing to be uh, an immigrant to this country. I mean, I was born here, but for all intents and purposes, we were an immigrant family. And it was sort of frowned upon and it was a difficult space to be in. So I remember trying to uh, shake all that off as quickly as possible and integrate as quickly as possible. And then I remember the joke was on me when about 10 years later, when Caribbean music hit the United States and everyone was into it and suddenly it was okay to be Caribbean. <laughs> I was like, oh man. <laughs> So did you did you go back and say, I'm really Caribbean? <laughs> <laughs> I tried. No one would believe it at that point. I was just a, the light skinned black guy with yeah. the heavy Brooklyn accent. <laughs> so was there anything though, was there any other uh family that, that drew your mother to, to Bed Stuy? Yeah, that's a really yeah. good question. So there was other family that drew us to Brooklyn, that's for sure. Okay. Um so uh, Flatbush, Brooklyn became sort of a Caribbean enclave in New York City, a couple other areas in Brooklyn. And as you, as you probably know, when immigrants come to this country and they settle, you know, if you look at uh, Park Hill in Staten Island in New York for the uh, Liberians, for instance, like there's just, you know, they tend to sort of settle in communities so that they can support each other. So I had an uncle that lived out in Flatbush, Brooklyn, um, I had a separate uncle who also lived in another area in Brooklyn, and it would be like this thing called the Caribbean Day Parade, which would happen on Eastern Parkway in Brooklyn each year. And so there was definitely a deep rooted uh, sort of uh, uh, Caribbean enclave in Brooklyn that came together to support each other. And the thing about when you get to America and you're Caribbean, it doesn't really matter which island you're from. If you're like Caribbean, then you support each other. And there's a, t as you know, there's a ton of islands in the Caribbean, and maybe there are distinctions when you're there, but I find that when we were together in Brooklyn, like, you know, you just sort of were part of this larger Caribbean community. Okay. So then tell me now, so what years, junior high and high school, what, what years is that, Glenn? Yeah, for me, I would have gone to uh, junior high school in 78, and then high school, I graduated in 88. Eight. Yeah, that sounds about right. So you figure up until just before the 90s, I was in primary school, if you will. And OK, so you graduated from high school in 88. Didn't exactly graduate from high school. OK, well, that, around that time. OK, we'll, yeah. we'll get to that. We'll get we're, to that. We're graduated. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Um, but but yeah. so tell me. Yes. Yeah. So what was you know, I, I grew up in New York, um, so I've got my own stories to tell. But for you there in the mid 80s, early 80s, mid 80s. What's Brooklyn like uh, as a community in, at that time period? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there was the good, the bad and the ugly, if you will. I'll start with the ugly. Um, if you lived in Brooklyn and you were black, you knew which communities to go to and which ones not to go to. Yeah. And, you know, there was no 12 foot fence, but you kind of knew where you belonged, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, uh, mostly because of the police department would make it clear where you belong and where you don't belong. So I remember Park Slope, you couldn't really hang out in without getting stopped and asked why you were there. Uh, Brooklyn Heights, you couldn't hang out there without getting stopped. Uh, definitely not Bensonhurst, Bay Ridge. Forget about it. Forget about the police stopping you. Yes, you get yeah. With cats yeah. in those neighborhoods. Um, and so that was the ugly of it. It was a lot of racism. And, you know, I recognized that as a result of my fair skin, that even I didn't ex, uh, wasn't exposed to the worst parts of it. I saw a lot of my dark skinned friends get treated a lot worse than I did, but I had my own share of dealing with racism in Brooklyn growing up. Um, and then I'd say the good part was, you know, the birth of hip hop um, in particular. Uh, I remember, you know, the, the, the growth of like fashion and the role fashion played in growing up. Um, I remember, conversations about black power 
and the value of black people. And, you know, so just there were many reasons why it felt good. Also, at the same time, you could feel a bit of a revolution happening and feel like you were part of it because you were, you know, in Brooklyn, like Brooklyn, you know, I'm sure there's a handful of other cities in the country similar, but Brooklyn, just if you were there, you felt like you were part of a black Mecca. And so as black people started to sort of make their way in this country around that time, um, there was a sense of pride uh, and opportunity. And I remember feeling feeling some of that pride. It, it, where did you go to high school, Glenn? I went to Clara Barton High School and I went to Prospect Heights High School, two high schools that were across the street from each other, but very different. Um, uh, Prospect Heights was uh, the tough you know, high school where it was really difficult to go to without being a good fighter. And, um, you know, people, you were sort of rewarded for doing all the wrong things, if you will. Mm. And then it was Clara Barton, which uh, used to be uh, in terms of gender, all women. And then they opened it up to uh, both uh, genders, if you will. And I was one of the first, you know, boys to go to that school, young men. and. Um, and one thing I remember is, is strength. All the things I could, you know, talk about with respect to high school, the thing that struck me the most that I always remember is when I was going there, they were doing construction on the high school. And I remember the, the ceilings were always wide open with plastic covering them, but you could see the piping and, and all of the infrastructure. And I remember two years into it, suddenly they said that the entire roof was covered with asbestos <laughs> and that we shouldn't have been in the school at all. Oh, my goodness. And, and then they started busing us to, to different schools. And as you can imagine, it's hard enough to be a young person going to high school, period. Like, you're just, your hormones are all over the place. Like, you're feeling yourself. You're feeling like you're an adult. And then suddenly you got to show up at school. By the time the buses leave, you're an hour and a half into your school day. You're being bused to a school where you don't recognize anyone. You don't know anyone. Um, it was terrible. I mean, it was terrible. It was definitely... I remember at least a year where I felt as though there was just no uh, educational programming happening, no visible, no meaningful educational programming. Yeah, well, that's interesting. I'm older than you, but uh, we, we lived in New Haven for two years. My mother was, was teaching at Yale, and uh, I didn't realize at the time, but I was one of the first black kids to be bused to this all-white school. and. Every morning, every morning, the few black boys would be encircled by the white boys and we would have to fight every single day. And it was the worst two years of my life. So, wow. you know, I, you know, I understand that. Um, so the, the schools themselves, they were different. But I mean, in terms of like the social economic, uh, were they, what were no, they like? They, they were poor and they were black, poor black American but you remind you you remind me. I've been working since I was fourteen. I mean, in New York at the time, maybe still today. If you got working papers, you could work as young as fourteen. And I remember I was delivering penny savers in Bensonhurst and, and Bay Ridge and Howard Beach and some of those places that are more white, Italian, white, uh, Irish, and so on. And man, you remind me of like here we are making like a quarter penny on every circular we deliver or something like that. And you had to deliver 10,000 to make a hundred bucks. And by the end of the day, you were covered with so much ink. I didn't have to worry about the light skin thing. But at the end of the day, I was covered in ink. Um, and I remember literally picking peaches and apples off of trees. So I'd have something to eat. That's how poor we were. I remember that. Yeah. Um, but I also remember getting chased with bats every day. <laughs> I remember I was like, why? Like, we're trying to deliver coupons to your house. Like, that's all I'm here for. And these young white boys would just come out with bats and sticks and chase us for our lives. I remember if you didn't find a van quickly enough and hop in it, you were in trouble. Well, I, I guess you really must have needed that job for you to continue. <laughs> I absolutely needed that job. Um, but, it, you know, I mean, look, I, I, my mother is a very hardworking woman till this day. Like even my mother today can't have a day go by where she's not up and out the house or doing something. Um, and and so I've always had that instilled in me, the importance of education, the importance of hard work, the importance of perseverance. 
the importance of taking advantage of opportunities. And so as tough as that job was, and as much as I faced racism, I mean, I have some other stories about racism along the way that if we get a chance, I'd love to share. Um, but I would say this, like the, the value of work itself and the lessons it taught me far outweighed uh, the disappointment I experienced in, in being treated in such a racist way yeah. as a 14-year-old. So let me ask you this, Glenn. Um, your mom is working her tail off for the three of you. Um, you said your brother, older brother, was on a little different trajectory. Tell me about two things. One, did she sit down with you and talk about how to deal with sort of race in America, number one? And number two, were there any male role models that began to come into your life during that particular time that you were able to get some mentorship and just being sort of a fatherly type figure? Yeah, thanks for those, both of those questions. Um, the first one, I'll answer the second one first, uh, okay. at least part two. You know, my older brother Sheldon, for me, was like my surrogate dad. Um, even though he was only a year older than me, uh, he seemed much wiser at the time. And he was willing to play the role of dad. And it was awkward for him because on the one hand, he wanted to show that he was like the man of the house, if you will, and impart wisdom and keep me safe and everything else. And on the other hand, I think he also thought that the sort of authoritarian uh, way of doing things made him land as more fatherly, if you will. And so it was like this difficult relationship of like wanting to learn from him because he's older than me. I looked up to him. I admired him. He was tough as hell. So courageous. Like I remember someone pulling out a weapon on my brother uh, as a child. He must have been 15. And I remember him walking right up to the guy and saying, if you're going to kill me, you better kill me now. And then like taking the gun out of the guy's hand and yeah. fighting him and beating the hell out of him. But um. I mean, it seems insane now, yeah. uh, but at the time, <clears throat> it just was part of like me looking up to my brother. But I also remember when my mother wouldn't be home, like he would definitely have this heavy handed, very sort of authoritative uh, approach to trying to teach me. And that was difficult. That was difficult. Like that caused some harm in our uh, relationship um, going forward. And then he became... <laughs> And then he became a correction officer after he got out of the military and ultimately a U.S. Marshal. And I'm not surprised by that. In some ways, yeah. whether you grow up with your dad or not, it's really strange how you tend to emulate your parents. And my dad, as a, as a former military, as former law enforcement, you know, my brother uh, ends up on exactly the same track. That's fascinating. That yeah. is interesting. And, and then for me, I'd say I picked up other... Uh, people who played the role of father figure um, in two ways. One was unfortunately in the streets. Um, so I'd say I picked up some negative male role models in the street and that didn't serve me well. And we can talk about that also. Um, but also, as I said, I've worked since I was a very young person. So I would do like this summer youth employment program and uh, working at the local fast food restaurant and so on. And every time I landed somewhere, inevitably there'd be a person of color uh, in a leadership role who would take a liking to me and invest in me. And, and that felt good. Uh, it felt unusual and strange because I didn't have a father figure in the home except my older brother who left when he was 17. Um, but it felt good to, to be able to see some people in, you know, in, meaningful roles that I could at least aspire to be. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, it was also a tough time in New York going from the 80s into the 90s and the crack epidemic and so on. And I would say also, in some ways, the streets began to raise me as a latchkey kid, you know, who was sort of looking to the street for role models. Um, I definitely found some people who led me in the wrong direction and paid a significant price for that, not just myself. Uh, but my family also. And I, I appreciate that, Glenn. And I, I'd like to talk about that. But, so, but the first part of the question was um, your mother, in terms of did she have any sort of words of wisdom about race in America? I mean, obviously, she yeah. hadn't been, I guess she hadn't really been in America, but 
Was she able to pull you to the side and say, son, you know, do this, yeah. do that. This is how it's going to be. Were there any of those kinds of conversations, Glenn? Yeah. You know, sometimes as a, as a, as such an advocate today, uh, you know, I consider myself an advocate no matter what I'm doing. I'm an entrepreneur, but I think in some ways I'm an advocate first and, and we'll get into that. Um, I wish I had a story about like this hard fighting, hard hitting black woman who, you know, imparted this information from me on me about how to deal with racism and so on. That's not how it went. What I ended up, what I, what I had, and it took me years to reconcile and, and lean into and even forgive was uh, a black woman who came to the United States and was scared to death of authority and scared to death of white people and white leadership mm. and, and was protective, right? In all of her, you know, sort of effort to protect her children, the message was more like, don't question authority. You're lucky to be here. Do what people tell you to do. Stay out of those neighborhoods, stay out of those schools. You know, if they say it's not for you, then it's not for you. And that was a difficult lesson. You know, I, it, took me, it took me decades to shake loose uh, some of those narratives that led me to believe that white Americans were smarter than me, that I couldn't do as much as they did, that I couldn't accomplish as much, that I couldn't be as successful. And, you know, I mean, you know, it's, it's not a criticism of her um, uh, because she, she definitely meant well, her intent was a positive intent, yeah. um, but the impact, the impact in a country like this to teach black young people that they can't trust their instinct that they can't rise to the occasion, that they can't be better, um, you know, is a double-edged sword. If you're thinking of it as a way to protect them, and ultimately I think it's really harmful, and I'll get into why, like I'll talk a bit about my current values and my current thinking and the work I've done as an advocate. But, um, but I think you know, she's, she's in a different place, obviously. Okay. So in retrospect, when you look back on it now, Glenn, do you think your mother was sort of, Typical of the of the particularly the, the Caribbean women of that time. Do you think that was she was a you know a typical no at that time? Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Um, I mean, the first thing I would remind people is, uh, you know, the United States uh, sort of has a has a machine that sort of delivers information all across this world about what it means to be in America, what the American dream looks like. You know, I mean, I saw John Wayne movies before I ever came to America. I saw, you know, the, the, the Western movies, the, you know, and, and that propaganda sort of helped shape the way my mother thought about the United States, the way she thought about white Americans and so on. And yes, it was very much part of the culture to like, keep your head down, get in where you can get in, get a job that pays a good salary, that'll move you towards having a retirement plan, healthcare, everything else. Um, and again, it really, you know, it worked well for some people, but I, I might've been the generation that was ready to break that mold yeah. or the generation that was living, particularly at a time when crime was going up and poverty and we had huge blackouts and there was just so much upheaval at that time um, that I just, I'm just not sure that sort of keep your head down, do the right thing, and things will work out model was, was for me. I definitely know it wasn't, actually. Okay. So you had mentioned when we talked about role models, male role models, and you talked about, you know, you had some role models from the streets that were negative, and you've mentioned a couple of times, you know, the whole crack epidemic, and I, I, I remember those times very well. When you look back on the role of drugs in the community, crack in particular, what kind of effect do you recall that having on your community in particular, Glenn? Man, it saddens me. Um, you know, I don't know if I was able to uh, process it the way I do today years ago, but uh, when, I think about, when I think about it now, it really saddens me. One of my first experiences with uh, crack cocaine was learning that uh, someone who I knew was addicted to, to drugs uh, before crack came along. But I remember he asked his money for his mother for money for crack cocaine and she didn't give it to him. 
And he went to the gas station and got gasoline and doused her bed and lit it on fire to punish her for not giving him money for gas. That's my first rem- memory of crack cocaine creeping into my community. Um, and I remember two versions of this story. One was the, the damage that it caused to so many individuals, so many family members, the deaths, the violence, the pain, the suffering. Um, and then I remember so many young black people thinking this was their road to liberty. This was their road to salvation. This was their road to wealth. And, you know, why not? Like you live in a country that bombards you with messaging about what gives you value, what gives you self-worth, you know, all of these material things, which, you know, I'm a person who believes in, in, in access to wealth now. Like we'll talk about my entrepreneurship. I'm not anti-capitalist. Um, uh, uh, but at the same time, when people see those images and they try to ask themselves, well, how do I get there? Then they look for the economic engine in their community. And when I was growing up, that was crack cocaine. And I see so many, I saw so many people, man, the suffering from that was so long. I saw people go from barely being able to buy a suit to wear to graduation in school, can't afford to go on a senior trip, can't afford to pay for pictures so that you end up in the yearbook, to driving, you know, $80,000 Mercedes Benz with like diamond encrusted in the car, you know, steering wheel. And it just, it just, it was, it was almost surreal when I think back on it, almost matrix like, Um, and it all came crashing down. Like, you know, I remember the heavy handed police response. I remember Giuliani's response. I remember seeing all these dreams just get crushed one by one. And it lasted for so long, it was so pervasive. Like even after the worst of it sort of went by, if you will, and we started coming out of it, like the suffering, the harm, the pain continued to take lives for many, many years afterwards. And I'm thinking about one person in particular, um, a good friend of mine named Matthew Allen, who anyone would look at and say he made it to the height of the drug game. And it was many, many years later after he was no longer, there was no drug game for him to be in. Like he sort of, you know, the, the, the the version of the drug game at the height of the crack epidemic was gone. It was gone and it left him hollow. And then he got murdered and then he got murdered years later for something he had done a decade earlier And so the harm, the suffering, the pain of the crack epidemic was long. And I think in some ways it still plays out because there were so many children born who were the children of addicts who now are dealing with the mental health and everything else attached to uh, being born from that situation. Yeah, well, it's, it's fascinating because, you know, I worked on Wall Street in the 80s and cocaine was the glamour drug you know i was just watching uh i can't remember what it's called but it's about the 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 86 mets i don't know whether you've seen that espn and it brought me back you know i had let my my sons watch it with me because i'd almost forgotten how crazy the 80s were and how wild they were and um yeah cocaine was it was an everyday thing if you worked on wall street you were a lawyer whatever it might be that was the thing to do. Um, and that was before, you know, the whole crack epidemic. But uh, no, it's it's fascinating how we we glo- we can glorify those types of things. Um, yeah. And people wanted to be like that. So, you know, I, I understand. My goodness. Um, so. Where does. Where does that. Your story sort of begin to go awry um, yeah. with the people that you're surrounding yourself with, with on the streets, Glenn? Yeah, you know, we're back at a time where violent crime is increasing in the United States. And I feel I'm having this sense of deja vu, particularly because so many young people are engaged in violent behavior right now. And because the response is like this heavy handed law enforcement response. And I'm just saying to myself, we did this. We did this three, four decades ago. We're about to do it exactly the same again. Like we know what kind of suffering it's going to cause. Like we got to be more creative. We got to do more of what works and less of what doesn't. 
And the reason I say that is because it brings me back to being 17, 16, 16. And I am shoplifting at Macy's on 34th Street in Manhattan, Herald Square. And I get arrested for shoplifting even before I take anything. Uh, I, I mean, to be honest, I was there to shoplift, but I didn't take anything. But the police officers, they came, they grabbed me, they took me downstairs. They threw me down a flight of stairs handcuffed, um, which fractured my left ankle. And then I remember the police officer coming to the bottom of the stairs and stomping on my face. Um, and then I end up in court and the judge gives me $1,500 bail and sends me to Rikers Island. And if you're poor, $1,500 might as well be $15 million because uh, it felt like ransom. Because when you're poor and you get money, guess what? You spend it, you don't save it. And so the idea of my mother raising 1500 just I knew it wasn't gonna happen. Um, but the judge said he was doing it to teach me a lesson and he had me come back to court three days later. And the third day, on my way back to court, I'm in a cell at Rikers and this guy walks up to me and he says, he says, give me your coat. And if you know anything about Rikers then and now, you have two choices, predator or prey. And that was my moment to make that choice. And we ended up fighting. I swung on him before he could even finish the sentence. And in the middle of that fight, I suddenly realized I was actually fighting multiple guys, multiple children. We were all children. We were 16, 17. And I felt myself getting beat up, getting jumped. And then I saw just red, blood everywhere, my shirt everywhere, and realized that I was actually being stabbed in the middle of the fight. I was stabbed four times. And the last time it was a pen that he had melted and made into a shank and he left it in my neck. You can still see the scar on my neck if I turn a certain way. Um, and I remember the correction officers laughing about it um, as they took me out of the cell and they asked me what I wanted to do. And they said, if you, if you say who stabbed you, um, you're going to be labeled a snitch and you won't be able to survive here. And I decided not to do that and instead to take a roll of paper towels and press it against my wounds and go to court that day. And, uh, and I remember seeing that judge and he, uh, he showed no shame. He showed no responsibility. Uh, he did let me go home that day. Um, but I remember going home thinking, well, you know what, if this is me, if this is what New York City has for me and I just lived through it, so be it. It just made me that much tougher. And the other thing that blew me away was when I got to Rikers and they opened the cell block and they let me in. As scary as it was, I realized I was suddenly in a cell block with half the guys who had disappeared in my neighborhood over the last few months. <laughs> well, I didn't know where they ended up. And it was so, so in some ways it was, the guys were familiar. Rikers was familiar. Um, and if you know anything about the insidious history of Rikers, it was purchased from a guy named Richard Riker, who used to run the courts in New York, but who also ran this thing called the kidnapping club at night where he'd grab young black men and bring them in front of his court the next day and send them back to the slave holding South, even though they were free. Um, <clears throat> and Rikers continues to operate till this day that way, but we're going back a few decades now. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I, I think there could have been such a huge opportunity to turn 16 year old Glenn's life around in that moment. There was so much opportunity. And instead, you know, the, the city of New York, the state of New York gave me, uh, you know, the most heavy handed sort of response to an attempted shoplifting charge. And it just made me tougher. And it made me resilient and it made me gravitate even more toward the streets. Like it taught me how to be tough. It taught me that the next time I went to Rikers, I'd be the one asking someone else, give me that jacket. And that's exactly what happened. Um, and I ended up going back and forth to jail until finally I got locked up for armed robbery. And uh, my first offer was 20 to 40. Um, and this was in my early twenties. And at the time, Luckily, I had enough money to pay a lawyer, a pretty good lawyer, and you can buy justice if you have enough money. And what I ended up getting was the lowest amount of time I could get for the charges. And I did three to nine. And I thought I'd be out soon because I had already done over a year at Rikers. Um, 
but there was a pretty tough governor in place at the time. And so I ended up doing uh, six years, but something happened. <laughs> um, you know, what I didn't say was that the original conviction kept me out of the Navy. I was going right behind my brother um, and come to find out that literally that conviction kept me out of going into the military. So really did change the trajectory of my life. Um, let, let, let me ask you this, Glenn. So that, that first time the judge says, you know, bail 1500, you, you come back in a few days. Were you expecting after you got stabbed and you went home for the day, did you have to go back to Rikers or, or were you free? I had to go back to court. So I didn't end up having to go back to Rikers, but I ended up with a conviction. Okay. And I ended up with what New York calls a youthful offender conviction, which technically is not a conviction and shouldn't be held against you. But when you're going into the military, everything matters. Arrests matters, convictions matter. And so while some employers may not have saw the youthful offender adjudication, the military did. And that was enough for them to give me an entry level discharge. So here I was thinking I was going to follow my brother Sheldon in his footsteps because he was doing so well. He got exposed to other religions, other people, other cultures, you name it. And it really changed his life. I mean, my brother ended up with the, the house on the on the mountain in San Diego with the white picket fence and, you know, two kids and et cetera, et cetera. And that's the trajectory I wanted to follow at the time. But the conviction, you know, we live in a country where criminal record conviction is a surrogate for race because of the disproportionate impact of people of color in the criminal justice system. And so I've been paying a price arguably for that judge's decision ever since. Yeah. Um, and even up until today, as a multimillionaire entrepreneur who owns 55 properties, there are still times when I apply for funding loans and the lender says to me, like, we found this conviction from 30 something years ago. Can you? explain it, you know, and I'm better situated than most real estate investors. Like I'm doing really well. And at the same time, the stigma, the sort of long shadow, the scarlet letter of a criminal conviction continues to follow me. And as it continues to follow many other men of color yes. in the country in particular. So in terms of Rikers, and I'm not familiar, I know Rikers, but I'm not familiar with the situation you're a juvenile at 16, right? Not in New York. In New York, if you're 16, you're charged as an adult and okay. put in with adults. Yeah, that law didn't change until about five years ago. And I'm glad to say I played a small role in that law changing. And I also played a very large role in the decision of New York City to shut down Rikers. So Rikers is on the trajectory to be shut down unless there's some huge change. And I am worried about the increase in crime and what that means. But um, I never forgot the impact of how I was treated at Rikers yeah. and what I experienced. And arguably, you know, I, until this day, I'm not as angry at the 16 year old who stabbed me as I am at the grown correction officers who laughed about it and who thought it was a joke. And the judge who sent me there to teach me a lesson. Um, but I did do work to shut down Rikers a few years ago and got the then mayor of New York, Mayor de Blasio, to finally agree to do so. Okay, no, yeah, I, I've, I've read about that, and I, I'd like to talk about that at some point, too. And so tell me then, Glenn, you go home, you know, you've been stabbed, you're bleeding. <laughs> when your mother sees you, what was that, what was that conversation like? Well... <laughs> I hate to lean into stereotypes here, but uh, go get the belt is what I remember. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, you know, she definitely uh, she definitely made it clear that I wasn't going to be living in her home and showing up that way. And I got to tell you, unfortunately, that led to me deciding not to live in her home. I left in her, I left her home between 17 and 18. Um, because the streets just pulled me a lot harder than she could at that time. Um, but yeah, I remember getting home and her, and she was ashamed and embarrassed. I remember that, you know, I, I also come from a Catholic upbringing and shame is a thing. <laughs> Guilt is a thing. Um, sinning is a thing. Yeah. And she carried that stuff very heavily. Um, you know, in terms of the community, it's a small community. 
And the idea that people would know that her son got arrested, her son wasn't doing well. Um, but that didn't stop me. You know, the, the, the sort of the call of the streets was just so much stronger for me at the time. And part of it was that I wanted to do everything to extricate myself from poverty. That's driven me most of my life, to be quite honest. I think until, until I finally got to the point where I was wealthy enough not to think about it and where I realized that wealth is important for different reasons than I thought it was. You know, I thought wealth was about material things and wealth is about liberty and freedom and access and voice. Um, but that wasn't the case for most of my life. Well into my adulthood, I've been chasing money or probably better stated as uh, running from poverty. Okay. So from what leads you then, you talked about some of the you know, running from poverty and the options appeared to be better on the streets. How did you, how did that situation begin to sort of spiral out of control for you? And you talked about, you know, armed robbery. I mean, what, what sort of led you to that particular point, Glenn, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, I don't mind you asking anything in this interview. Um, so I remember during the crack epidemic, um, heroin was also a drug that made people a lot of money. And I was surrounded by a lot of people who were either manufacturing drug, drugs, distributing drugs, or selling drugs. Um, and yet, Strangely, it just sort of wasn't for me. And this is going to sound really weird. Um, I found it to be, I was a bit of a punk, you know? Like, as I tell this story, I don't want anyone to sit here and be like, oh man, it sounds like he was a pretty, t I was a punk. And selling drugs scared me. I'll tell you why. <laughs> because it was so much interaction that had to happen that could go wrong. It was like, you know, the, the beef you'd have with your partner, the beef you'd have with the guy who sells it to you, the beef you'd have with the person buying it from you, the beef you had with the police department. Like, there was just so many things that could go wrong that, like, I was always intelligent and my calculation suggested that this is, if I'm going to do the wrong thing to make money, this is not going to be it. <laughs> although, although I couldn't get away from hanging out with people who were selling drugs because the majority of young Black men in my community did so. Um, but going from shoplifting to robbery just wasn't a huge leap. It might sound so to the listener, but, um, what I was really thinking of was how do I make more money? If I'm going to take risk, how do I make more money? And in some ways I was like, this is my lane. The same way in real estate. Now people ask me, do you want to buy commercial properties? Do you want to buy a multi-unit building? And I'm always like, no, 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 I'm in my lane. Like I know this lane. I understand this lane. I'm going to stay in this lane. I'm just going to get better at what I do in this lane. Mm -hmm. In some ways, arguably, same thing on the streets. Yeah. I knew what I knew, and that's what I was gonna keep doing. And, and that rationale got me in a lot of trouble. Um, so the sort of natural progression is you go from shoplifting to other types of uh, robberies that are unarmed to armed robberies of smaller businesses, movie theaters, things like that. To like, I want to make more money, jewelry stores and places where the money is, if you will. And that was my progression. And uh, when you're living in the streets, it doesn't seem as wrong as it might seem to the ears of people who have never lived that life, believe it or not. I, I, like we live in a world where there's, there's people like us now, us, me, like on this one track and there's like this track right next to it with people who are not in the economy, if you will, but they're in a different economy. They're in a, a, a behind the scene economy. They're in a black market economy, if you will. And I was there before. And this, there's an economy there, there's parallels. A lot of people don't realize, there's huge parallels actually. Um, in fact, when people say to me, how do you turn your life around? I'm like, same skills, just different context. You know, I mean, I've become a heck of a nonprofit fundraiser. Like that didn't come from nowhere. Like. You, if you walk into a jewelry store and you convince a person to lock the door and let you in and sit you down before you end up robbing them, those skills are not that much different than walking into the Ford Foundation and walking out with a half a million dollar check to fund your nonprofit. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
So, yeah. gosh, I feel like I'm off the question. Um, no, 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 you are. But so let me ask you this, because it's where during that period, um, from the time you left your mother's home or she asked you to leave to the time that, you know, you committed this last crime. How, how many years are we talking about, Glenn? About seven years in between there. Um, and where, where, are you, where are you living? Man, I'm living it up. I mean, I'm robbing <laughs> jewelry stores eventually. I'm making a lot of money. I have an apartment in Brooklyn. I have a house in Long Island. I have a motorcycle. I have two cars. Um, and I'm hanging out with drug dealers who have 10 times more money than I do. I had a, the guy, Matthew Allen, I talked about, nicknamed Scarface. I mean, you, you go to his apartment and you're walking in half a foot deep money on the floor in his apartment just because he doesn't know how to spend it. It's all over the place. Um, and so I was hanging around people who were making a lot of money, hanging out with people like P. Diddy and, 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 and Biggie Smalls. And it was just, it felt real at the time. And now as I talk about it, it just feels uh, surreal. But, um, but yeah, that's, you know, I was moving from apartment to apartment. And what I remember is that I never felt grounded never felt safe, uh, never felt like there was a future. Like, I mean, I, I remember waking up and going to the store to buy clothes to wear that day, almost every day. Like there was no planning for the future. They was just living in the moment. Um, and, and, you know, the reason I'm walking you through this is because I want people to hear it. I want people who didn't live that life to understand that it's not as, you know, it's easy to define it as perverse. and and it's really not. It's actually people who are living in this in this lane here wanting the same things that you want in your lane, but feeling as though the options are limited. Like when I was a young person, if you put uh, a college scholarship on a table and a bag of crack or a nine millimeter handgun, like I'd see much more opportunities in those things than in the college scholarship. Why? Because this wasn't real to me because people who made it out didn't come back. Sheldon didn't come back. When Sheldon made it out, he didn't come back. He didn't come back for almost a decade. And, and why would he? He was scared. He was like, I don't want to get pulled back into that trap. So again, if you don't mind me asking, in, in terms of that seven years and your relationship with your dad, your mom, your older brother, and Adam, what, 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 yeah. what was that like, Glenn? Yeah, it was torn apart. It was torn apart. So I took care of them financially. But that didn't do anything for the real relationship, the kinds of relationships that we have now. I mean, I'd show up at my mother's house with a pillowcase full of jewelry and just pull out a handful and say, this is for you. If I'm going to jail, someone's going to benefit from this. That didn't buy me a deeper relationship with my mother. That, that bought me some uh, uh, ability to assuage my guilt, you know, because uh, I was guilty. I felt poorly about it. I felt badly about it. And I could say to myself, well, I just gave her $2,000, so she'll be okay. And then come to find out years later that my younger brother built up all this animosity towards me because he felt like he lost his brother to the streets, mm -hmm. you know? And then ultimately he ended up in the streets and he ended up locked up and he ended up going in and out of Rikers. And it was hard for me to see the correlation between like the loss of family, the loss of togetherness. And then when I ultimately went to prison, I mean, I was 10 hours from home. So you had to get on a bus, ride 10 hours to see me, stay on the visit floor for 10 hours, and then travel home for 10 hours. That's 30 hours to go from New York City to upstate New York and back. Who's got, how is that sustainable? Yeah. It's not sustainable, and it's difficult to maintain a relationship. So all of those things fell apart. All of those things fell apart for me. And it wasn't until like this moment in prison that things started to change for me. And you talk about mentors and you talk about people having an impression. Whenever you ask people what helped them become successful, you know, people rarely talk about programs and jobs and those sort of things. They talk about people. And, and it was the first time that an adult in a position of authority said something to me that no one had ever said before. I go to prison and I'm going through orientation and I take this test to figure out what kind of job they're gonna give me. And this guy who's doing the testing walks over to me and he puts his hand on my shoulder and says, now man, mind you, I'm facing nine years in prison. You know, At the very least I'll do three, at the very most I'll do nine. 
And he looks down at me and he says, he says, wow, your grades are amazing. You should go to college. And I'm like, is this guy like messing with me? Like, I, this is like the worst moment of my life. Like I am, you know, it's hard to even see a future when you're doing that much time in your early 20s. And, um, and he was serious. Like a week later, I ended up transferred 10 hours from New York next to Attica. And there's a college program. And it's a college program that came out of the Attica Rebellion in the early 70s. And so here I am benefiting from the blood and the, and the lives of people who gave their lives to at least have a criminal justice system that had some semblance of rehabilitation. And so the fact that this guy said it to me and the fact that I ultimately landed at a college program didn't get lost on me. And I suddenly felt this heavy sense of responsibility to take advantage of it. Um, and I wish somebody would have said to me, you should go to college when I was in high school. No one did. No one did. In fact, I remember my guidance counselor calling me to her office and saying the opposite. I remember her saying, you'll probably never be able to afford college. I know about your family situation. You probably should think about how to get a job or a vocational trade. And you know what I heard? You're going to be you're going to be in low wage, crappy jobs like your mother for the rest of your life. And that didn't sit well with me. And that set me off. Um, and in some ways, this put me back on track. And I don't want to romanticize the moment, but the fact that I remember it 26 years later suggests that it was impactful. And, and sadly, if I saw this gentleman right now standing in front of me, I may not even recognize him, but that doesn't matter. What it did teach me is that if you can plant the seed in a young person that will grow into a tree that will cast shade that you may never enjoy, but that doesn't even mean that you shouldn't plant that seed. And that's what he did that day, he planted a seed. And I ended up at a two-year quality liberal arts program, learning sociology and psychology and religion and philosophy. And, and suddenly I was freer sitting in a prison cell than I had ever been in Bedford Stuyvesant, in Brooklyn, growing up as a young man of color. And, and that, it, so it didn't turn my life around. It actually opened up a world of opportunities to take the skill sets I already had and apply them differently. And, and during the six years you're in prison, in terms of, you know, that, that first violent episode is what role is violence playing as you're, you know, you're, you've gotten this sort of tap on the shoulder about, you know, you can, you can move on to something fantastic and you're exposed to other worlds. What, what's, what's prison life still like at that time, Glenn? Yeah. So a couple of things. The first year when you're sort of fighting your case, you are at Rikers. So I was back at Rikers years later. And at that time, I was pretty toughened. I'd become really hardened in the streets. And so instead of being the victim at Gladiator School, which is what people tend to call Rikers Island, um, I became the, the victimizer, arguably. Like I held down the cell block. I surrounded myself by other young guys who I knew were rolling with me. And, you know, we did have a certain standard, but we also did a lot of mean things to a lot of people. Um, but my point is this, I had learned how to jail at that point and I jailed really well and I kept myself safe for a year. So I thought I was gonna go up to state prison and do that for five more years or however long I needed to stay there. And in some ways, Rikers became the training ground for surviving the next few years. And I get to prison and I walk into the block and there's a guy next to a microwave. I was like, first of all, wow, we have a microwave. And this guy's opening a can of tuna with a can opener. And I'm looking like, oh, I need the top to that can of tuna because that's going to be the weapon I use to keep myself safe. And he takes the top off the can of the tuna, the can of tuna, and he throws it in the garbage and he makes tuna and he has a sandwich. And I'm just like blown away. Like, what's going on here? Like, why? <laughs> like, how does he even get, like, I'm thinking the top of the can of tuna is sharper than any razor blade I've ever seen on Rikers. And he's throwing it in the garbage and he's just eating. And then, you know what I came to realize? That it's all relative, but that Rikers is a really horrible place. Like, when you think of our criminal justice system in this country, like, Rikers is the culmination, the sort of 
the manifestation of the worst of everything we have to offer. And I think there's reasons for that. Like it's on an island, it's remote, there's only one way on, one way off. The fact that it was purchased from this guy, Richard Riker, the racist history of it, the isolation of it, et cetera. The fact that there's mainly black and Latinx officers now who, who unfortunately, when they see young black people come on the island, they, they have this disdain for them because it's like, I made it, why couldn't you? There's, there's this internalized oppression playing out. But then when I got to state prison, don't get me wrong, it was racist. The first thing I remember a white correction officer saying to me was, you see those trees up there on that hill? My grandfather planted those trees. This is my land. You can leave here on your feet or you can leave here in a pine box. I don't really care. That's almost word for word. And then on my way out, having a correction officer say to me, thanks for being here. He said, you help me buy my boat. And when your son gets here, he's going to help my son buy his boat. So it was definitely systematic racism throughout yeah. our prison system. But I had learned that like, if you stay away from certain things in prison, and if you took advantage of any opportunities that might have existed, and they weren't many, that you actually could make it through and get some kind of value despite all of those insidious things that were happening. And that's what I did. Yeah. Um, and like any other college experience, it wasn't just the textbooks. It wasn't just the credential at the end. It was the lifelong relationships that you built. And it was the experiences uh, uh, that you have as you're learning you know, in my case, things like Russian literature, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy. And I was learning things in prison that no one had exposed me to before, but I just wasn't doing it by myself. I was going through it with other men. We lock up some of America's best and brightest in this country. And I had the chance to work closely with those men, all of us towards this college credential. And what, while you're working on the college credential, Glenn, the, the instructors, what, what were they like? I mean, were they, were the most part, they, they were encouraging. Um, t- tell me what they were like for you. Yeah, what I really appreciated about the professors who came in, both men and women, was that they came in with the exact same curriculum that they just taught in the external college program just a couple of hours earlier. And they kept making reference between what their free students were doing and, and saying and sharing and what we were doing, and they all, so consistently that I knew it was true, would say by far, they love teaching in the prison more than teaching on the outside. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't they? We weren't distracted, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have relationships necessarily going on. Like there was all these different things that allowed us to focus on the work. And I remember they would bring in stories. And so when you're in prison, even if you read the newspaper, you watch television, it's just not the same. Like it, it, there's a bit of, there's a bit of cognitive dissonance, like trying to figure out what's real and what's not. Mm-hmm. Like when you get all of your information from a newspaper and from television, you actually lose context about what's real and what's not. Like you lose the uh, uh, exchange with human beings that allow you to sort of sort through, you know, uh, what's, what's given to you by the media. And they would bring that to us. They would bring real world debate and conversation about what was actually happening. And it was this one professor I'll never forget because it sort of brought things so close to home for me because uh, the United States invaded Grenada in 1984. And I was a young child going back and forth sometimes to visit my dad. And he got shot in the middle of that invasion as the the chief of police. He was at the police department. And when the war broke out, uh, someone came into the police department, he got shot. And... (laughs) <laughs> and when the United States came, they came and said that they were rescuing American students that were at a medical school that was there in Grenada. Um, although I think the real argument was that they thought that the spread of communism would happen there because the Cubans were building an airport and they worried about that giving the communists too much infrastructure too close to the United States. Um, but their argument was they wanted to get these students and save these students. And this professor was one of those students at the, at the medical school. Uh, he was teaching us biology. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, I felt safe, safer in Grenada than I've ever felt in the United States until the Americans got there. Mm. 
And he said, that's when I suddenly no longer felt safe. And, you know, there was so much damage to the infrastructure and the beauty of the island and so on. Anyway, but my point was this, like, I had some sense of what happened. I was 14 at the time. Here I was 23, 24, many years later. I'm in this college program in prison. And here's this professor taking out time to talk to me and help me understand what it was like to be in the middle of that. It felt as though he was giving me, like, more of my own history, like, mm-hmm. context, like, helping me understand context in a way that, you know, I didn't as a younger person. Um, definitely one of the most moving experiences in my life. Not just the first guy who said you should go to college, but every single professor who stood in front of me and believed that I could be more than I thought I could be at that moment. Yeah. Well, no, Glenn, um, and I, I've already kept you for an hour and uh, obviously we haven't even, <laughs> we've barely touched the surface here. But I, can I ask you one more question before I let you go? Yes, sir. I know you talked about, we didn't talk about it very much, but you mentioned about being Catholic. Um, there was a role there uh, in the family. Can you, was there any, what role did that play during your period of incarceration, if any? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, you know, when I was in the streets, it was just much easier to let go of God in a church and of religion and and those sort of things like it wasn't like I didn't have a moral code most people in the streets did but I didn't want the responsibility of religion and I didn't want the responsibility of of God every day in my life and so I arguably went into prison thinking that that's how I'd survive like I wouldn't worry about what God thought about what I had done and they say there's no atheists in foxholes And prison is a foxhole. And it's only a matter of time before you're in a dark cell, freezing with a correction officer not feeding you well and and calling you names before you find God again. And that's for most people who go to prison. And so I found God in prison and been working ever since then to repair that relationship. And I've gone through other dark moments in my life. Like, that's the other thing I want people to hear. My life is not linear, like, Things were bad, things were good. You know, life is a roller coaster. Uh, And even in all of my success now, I have dark moments. Uh, Although I find that I learn more in the valley than I do on the mountaintop. And so I embrace those times when I'm in the darkness because I know there's light up ahead on the horizon, always. Um, But I remember finding God in prison and trying to rebuild that relationship and then continuing to do so up until this day. And right now, God plays a huge role in my life and my ability to help others in particular. Um, You know, God has helped me through the toughest times in my life, but equally important, uh, every single time uh, I go through a journey and come out the other side, I feel like what he's also doing is preparing me to help others who are in crisis. And today I run two businesses, a real estate business with 55 properties in three cities in the South, Birmingham, Montgomery, and, and Savannah. But also I run a nonprofit consultancy and the majority of what I do is to help other leaders uh, navigate crisis, navigate some of their darkest moments. And God gives me the strength to do that every day. Yeah. I'm thankful for that. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's a powerful way to end. Uh, thank you, Glenn. Um, powerful story, my friend, powerful story. And it's, uh, it's inspirational. And that, you know, it's, as you know, I don't have to tell you, there's so many people who have gone through more and less and are, are not here today. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a tremendous blessing to be able to still be alive, be able to share experiences, help others. So uh, you're an inspiration, my friend, and uh, thank you very much. Yeah, amen, brother. Likewise, keep up the good work. Thanks for the opportunity again. Thank you. This is the Black Experience for all. If you like what you hear at the Black Experience, please consider clicking on the join button to support our nonprofit. I'm Adam P. Kennedy. Thank you for joining us. This is the Black Experience for all.